Okay, so we have our case here. So this is a sorry, this a seventy-two-year-old female. <laughs> I hope it's not the same case. I could have done that. Uh, an optometrist uh, who noticed a retina problem. Sounds familiar. Um, the patient has no symptoms. Um, she just has some um, hypertension, but hypertension from it. Her own. Um, her visual acuity is 20-25 in both eyes. Um, IOP is 18 and 20. Then here's the first image. Okay, so we're looking at the right eye, color fundus photo. Um, the media seems clear. The cup to disc ratio looks small. Looks like the nerve has crisp borders. The vessels look appropriate. Uh, maybe... Actually, maybe a little bit of attenuation, just superior to the disc. And then attention is drawn to the macula. There's some areas of what look like hemorrhages along the, maybe the cilioretinal artery or vein there, um, like flame-shaped hemorrhages and some dot blot hemorrhages along that vessel. Do you see AV nicking? Yeah, maybe some AV nicking down below the disc and then where Grant is pointing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Grant. Left eye looks pretty similar. Maybe some, some lipid exudate superior, but otherwise looks pretty good. Right eye again, we have a multicolor photo. You can see the hemorrhages and you can kind of appreciate maybe some more hard exudate um, along the vessels, the arcades. You know, the multicolor shows superficial stuff very well. So mm -hmm. I think that's probably almost every retinal membrane that's been. Oh, okay. It's inner retina. It's weird. The multicolor is more of an inner retinal imaging, and the IR is more of an outer retinal. If you see it on IR, then I don't think we're showing it. We, I don't know. They give you an IR. Keep going, but it's an IR there. I think we have one. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and then you can just see these hemorrhages more. Um, same thing in the left eye, so like possible ERM. Okay, so we have the IR here. You can see these hypo-reflective area corresponding to the blood that we saw in that first photo. In the left eye, nothing too remarkable. Okay, so we have a OCT of the right eye here. Um, media looks clear. There looks like there's an appropriate contour starting of the PVD, and there's some intraretinal spaces here, some kind of cystic looking spaces just in the fovea. Um, in the left eye here, you can see clear media. Looks like there's an appropriate contour in the fovea. And then um, there's not those same cystic spaces that we saw on the right eye. Okay, so we have on the right eye here, we can see some elevation and uh, those cystic spaces just inferior in the fovea or just in the MAC associated with thickening and yeah. some intraretinal edema. Um, maybe some hyperreflective areas as well surrounding it. But yeah. So we have an FA here. The right eye. So this looks like the arterial phase. So there doesn't seem to be any leakage right now that I can appreciate just yet. Or there's some areas of uh, hypofluorescence that seem to correspond there with the 
areas of bleeding that we saw in the previous photos, but not really um, leaking just yet. Okay. There's, there's quite a few of these. Okay. Um, more so in the AV phase. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, so here we can kind of see, uh, this looks like the lamellar phase of the FA, um, we're starting to see closer to the disc, there's some possible areas of leakage there, um, more so. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, it looks like we can kind of see this, um, the vessel that might be might be the uh, culprit for these leaking spots of blood, but if we keep going, we can see. Would you say that's an artery or a vein? Um, well, I I think it's more of a vein. You can quite get to the artery. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking because it lit up later, but. Well, you can see, you can see, go back to the very beginning of the article. Very, very the first one. To quote the first. Chairman Meredith Reed Paven, the retina is heterosexual. It is not <clears throat> non binary, it is not transgender. Arteries cross veins, and veins cross arteries in the retina. That's what the retina does. So let's start <laughs> at the beginning here with arteries. Mm -hmm. Look at look at the arteries that we've got filling here in the arterial phase. Everything here is an artery. Everything across with the white line is what? Vein. Correct, because the retina is non non binary. Um, let's keep going now. <laughs> slowly, slowly. We want to go slowly. Slow. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Slower. You can figure out if that's an artery or a vein. Go back to the arterial phase. Is the vessel in question bright or not bright right now? Not, not bright. So what is it? Vein, correct. And you can see it where there's an artery, a bright artery crossing what eventually becomes the bright vessel in question. And since the retina has arteries crossing veins, that's more evidence that that's a vein. Right there, yeah. see that? Yeah. You put your cursor. Who's got control of the right cursor? Do we have that? Uh, we have a different. Yeah, sure, right, a, yeah. So you the, see right the there. Go ahead and trace it back. Trace it back, and right there, you see it crossing something that was bright earlier. Mm. If you go back, you'll see that thing just to the left of your red dot it was bright pretty early. At the right, go to the left. A little more left, right there. Yeah, that was bright earlier. This branch here. Yep. Mm. And then if you then if you go back, that branch you had the dot on is not the vessel in question. The branch that you had the dot on was one of the secondary arteries, second order arteries. If you go north, if you go up, you'll see the vessel, the vein that's turning bright right there, crossing. That's right. If you trace it back, that's the vessel that's leaking, crossing that bright artery there. And the retina doesn't care that 2023 is it is So, so go on, you can describe, go to the late phase and you can describe what's happening in the late phase. Okay. Is that like two minutes? Okay. So um, if we compare to the previous ones, we can see that there's, there's leakage in the areas where we saw some bleeding and also areas of hypofluorescence associated with the spots of blood. Um, it looks like the distal ends there's more leakage. Um, and I, I would say it's more so leakage than staining because it seems to expand over time. 
So what, what I'm confused about is where is that vein tracing all the way back to? I'm trying to see where it hooks up to the venous system. Maybe there? Yeah. You see where it hooks up to the venous system? It looks like it kind of goes into kind of the disc. It goes more, goes yeah. more into the disc kind of than yeah, hooking it's kind up of the first, disc. Sort of first order vein. Yeah, it's the disc margin. It's like a cilio retinal <clears throat> vein almost, kind of. Maybe, but it doesn't go at the edge. Not really at the edge. Yeah, yeah I think it's going into the central vein. Just, just hooking over the disc. It's having a little issue, I think, getting over the disc. <laughs> <laughs> So what? So uh, so what do you think is going on here? Um, well, it looks like maybe a a branch retinal vein occlusion. Yes. Uh, associated with hemorrhages, and we can see the leakage on the FA. Um, we've established that it's a vein not only by the presentation of the blood, but also just tracing it in the FA. So that would be high on the differential. Um. What, is, uh, what do you do? With this? What, can you come up with other? We got to come up with some more. Though, just got to agree. Yeah. Uh, um, she. We saw some AV nicking as well. They're flame hemorrhages. They do seem focal, but I guess hypertensive retinopathy you could also consider. But um, I would kind of expect to see hemorrhages elsewhere if that was it. Um, you know, she has these hemorrhages and abnormal blood vessels in the MAC, so maybe like um, some type of macular telangiectasias. Um, Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, sometimes those are tricky to differentiate. These small vein occlusions, macular telangiectasia. And even the other thing is if you had a couple distinct spots in a male that weren't necessarily related to a single vessel, that would be Coates disease, which is macular telangiectasia. Yeah, so that's a good differential. But you can always see, you can always see diabetes. with the diabetes, and you can always see radiation retinopathy. Mm -hmm. They all kind of, they have, those three kind of live together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good. We hit a lot of these. Uh, All right. So this was a macular uh, branch retinal vein occlusion, which is kind of a special kind of BRVO. So I'll kind of go over retinal vein occlusions and uh, then talk about a little bit about the macular. Um, so we have uh, all different kinds of retinal vein occlusions kind of categorized um, by the anatomy affected and then also by the size. Um, so you can have a central retinal vein occlusion uh, or a hemi, hemi retinal vein occlusion, depending on where uh, which branch it is. And then you can have uh, smaller branch occlusions as well. Uh, so for example, a major branch uh, vein occlusion can be a first order venule draining one of the four quadrants of the eye. Um, and then you can have smaller BRVOs, uh, which drain higher order venules. Um, you can have an inflammatory BRVO, which co-occur with vasculitis. Um, and you typically see them, uh, they're usually peripheral and there's multiple of them and they're at different stages. Um, and then you can have an ischemic versus a non-ischemic uh, retinal vein occlusion, um, which is based on the size. So if you have greater than five disc diameters, uh, it's ischemic or smaller, it's a uh, non-ischemic. And for inflammatory, some people make a big deal on the floor seeing that there's a hot spot right, right at the right where it's occluded. So you know it's, it, you don't see it commonly, but it's kind of cool when you see it. And you'll see a little hot spot and people say, oh, that might be inflammatory. Even in, if you see a toxin lesion, that's inflammatory. Which, right, good job. So some of the smaller uh, branch retinal vein occlusions, you can have a, a twig BRVO. Um, which is just one of those smaller ones that you might see sometimes out in the periphery. And that's for the second order or higher uh, venules. Um, and then you can specifically, there's a subcategory of macular BRVOs, um, which is occlusion of a, a small macular tributary venule um, that's not involving one of the major arcades. So that's what we had in our patient. Um, they can be subtle and uh, difficult to diagnose and they may require an FA. Um, neovascularization is less likely to occur um, in these BRVOs because there's less uh, ischemic area and fewer cytokines floating around. Um, macular edema is frequent. Um, the rate they quote is 97%. And that's because you have blood retina breakdown and you're, you're in the macula. Um, these uh, smaller vein occlusions have a better response to anti-VEGF 
um, and they're less likely uh, to progress um, than a major BRVO, and they may uh, actually self-resolve out anti-VEGF. Um, so this was a pretty interesting uh, diagram on just the pathophys of uh, vein occlusions. So you have your inciting event, you get hypoxia and release of all these uh, cytokines that we block with our uh, injections. Um, and that induces uh, cellular adhesion and chemotaxis, um, which can sort of start a cycle of uh, additional cytokine release and more hypoxia, uh, more inflammation, leading to more cytokines. So you get this cycle going. Um, so in a lot of cases, we need anti-VEGF injections to kind of break this cycle. Um, that leads to eventual breakdown of the blood retinal barrier uh, and macular edema. Um, the exact pathophysiology of vein occlusions is multifactorial, not necessarily well-defined. Um, ultimately, uh, you get disruption of the endothelium of the vein and disruption of laminar flow. Um, often it's caused um, at the site of um, an AV crossing, so you get uh, compression of the vein by a rigid artery that's developed um, arterial sclerosis. Um, and then uh, if the patient has any kind of hypercoagulability, that lowers the, the threshold for occlusion as well. Um, loss of a, a visual acuity um, can be from macular edema primarily, um, but then also ischemic maculopathy can also play a role. Um, so about 17% of BRVOs are macular, it's a relatively small amount. Um, hypertension is by far the most common cause um, but th there's also associations with cardiorespiratory disease, diabetes, and inflammatory disorders. It's a note on diabetes. I've seen um, opto questions where they single out diabetes as not being a risk factor for BRVOs, but the sources that I had included it, so it's probably debatable. Um, so for BRVOs in general, they're most common in the Hispanic population um, and least common in uh, whites. Um, there's no sex predilection, and a fair amount can be bilateral. So it's important to look in both eyes. And you get that question. People ask, is this going to go to my other eye? And you're like, it doesn't go to the other eye, but it's just kind of who you are. <laughs> you are a <as> so, person. Because <laughs> you'll see it. It's, it's not because it seems rare, but people say, oh, you'll see it in both eyes. Like, oh, that's rare. But it's not that rare. It's 5 to 10% of the other eye. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... Uh, Risk factors include age, um, all these hypertension, hyperlipidemia, the classic causes, interestingly high pulse pressure. So maybe if somebody has aortic insufficiency or something, um, you can have an increased risk. Ocular hypertension, poor ocular perfusion and glaucoma, um, often see that. Um, of course, AV nicking as one of the primary uh, pathophysiologic causes of the vein occlusion, or if you have a focal narrowing in a vessel. Um, Elevated BMI, especially if their age is less than 50, is an important risk factor. And then any kind of uh, thrombophilic um, cause, um, specifically hyperhomocysteinemia and anticardiolipin have, are well, um, well documented. Um, and then all these other um, hypercoagulable states are uh, a little bit controversial, but logically it makes sense that they would be associated with an increased risk. Um, signs and symptoms, so patients can be asymptomatic, like our patient. Um, they can have blurring or distortion of the vision. 60% um, of patients uh, maintain visual acuity within two lines of baseline. Um, the vision is painless, uh, and they can have a visual field defect that starts out relative and then progresses to an absolute stigma. Um, on fundus exam, you'll see the classic blood and thunder with flame hemorrhages, dot blot hemorrhages. You can see cotton wool spots, exudates, um, and retinal edema. Um, the the vest vein itself can be dilated and tortuous, um, which is important to differentiate that from ocular ischemic syndrome. Um, you'll have uh, capillary non-perfusion um, on FA. You can see MAs, uh, sclerotic veins, and telangiectasias as well. Um, so uh, macular vein occlusions can have some subtle findings, um, and they these findings may hide in the presence of other retinal conditions, 
Um, for example, discoform exudative macular degeneration, or if somebody has an obvious diabetic retinopathy and they have little bleeds everywhere. And so it might be easy to, to miss uh, just a little tributary with, you know, surrounding um, so small BRBO. Um, uh, an FA can make the diagnosis more discernible. Um, so like we saw, um, it has there's delayed filling. Um, you can have vessel wall staining, Irma, and collateral vessels. Um, and we saw leakage in our patient as well. Um, and that characterizes the extent of the non-perfusion. Um, so for evaluation, these patients can have a complete uh, history and exam, gonioscopy, uh, especially if they have um, ocular hypertension to monitor for neovascularization. Um, it could be that, you know, the vein occlusion happened months ago and they've already developed neovascularization. OCT is important for showing uh, macular edema, um, which can be easily treatable. I mean, Jeff. Um, and then FA can aid in the diagnosis, like we've mentioned. Um, and then just a, a basic workup, uh, especially if a patient is under 50, um, uh, to look for systemic causes uh, of their vein occlusion. Um, and then you also may, may want to consider inflammatory workup if they have other symptoms that are suggestive. Um, so OCT is kind of nice because it's not as affected by the intraretinal hemorrhages. Uh, we saw in our FA that there was a lot of blocking um, from those hemorrhages on our FA. Um, and it shows really nicely that the cystoid macular edema, um, which has intraretinal hyperreflectivity and shadow, which are the hemorrhages. Um, and then you can also see subretinal fluid. Um, disruption of the ellipsoid zone um, after macular edema correlates with poor visual acuity. That's uh, because you have photoreceptor cell death. Um, the management uh, is to uh, prevent and treat vision loss from macular edema, uh, ischemia, and neovascularization. Uh, Anti-VEGF is kind of the mainstay of treatment nowadays, um, but laser photocoagulation has been used in the past and can also be used um, in, in considered in refractory cases. Um, same thing goes for steroids. Um, if there's an associated non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage, then a uh, vitrectomy may be indicated. Well, there's one more option as of last week, a bonus points for anyone who knows the extra option. Oh, in the anti-VEGF column. So but there's a new... But it's not really anti-VEGF. Oh, there's in the new... label, it's specifically it's called receptor. a bi-specific right. growth receptor. Yeah. Is it the bi-specific? Yeah, the bi was approved last week. Extra wow. credit. Thank you. I wasn't by her name. I don't get extra credit because I don't have a bi in my anti-VEGF slide. Um, <laughs> but so uh, if there's any macular edema associated with a uh, vein occlusion, uh, then anti-VEGF uh, can be considered. Um, there's a whole bunch of different trials that have looked at um, the effectiveness of the macular edema. Um, typical um, dosing schedule uh, in a lot of these trials, Bravo, Cruise, and Vibrant, is uh, monthly for uh, six injections, um, and then patients are tapered off. Um, and the Horizon trial is a little bit different. They went for 12 months um, and then switched the PRN. Um, but just to review, we have Avastin. Um, the original anti-VEGF, which is bevacizumab, which is a full-length antibody for VEGF. Um, Lucentis, which is ranibizumab, which is an antibody fragment um, that binds VEGF-A with higher affinity than uh, bevacizumab. Um, and then you have ILEA, which is a flibercept, um, which is a recombinant protein, uh, which with VEGF receptor 1 and 2 domains fused to an FC portion of IgG1. It has the strongest affinity for VEGF-A. Um, and it also um, VEGF B placental growth factor affinity too. So you kind of get a dual action of ILEA. That's it. So for, for injection therapy, that was excellent. You guys are doing an amazing job. For injection therapy, there's a paper that came out. I can't tell, I probably might have my phone somewhere, but there was a long-term study and at four years, because like, patients always ask this, at four years, 60% four, of patients with branch vein occlusion are off shots and 40% of patients with central vein occlusion are off shots. So generally for, so people say, well, how long do you need this? And they say, well, you know, there's about probably 50, 50, but if you want to get more specific, you can. So branch vein is a little better than central vein, but about half the patients need ongoing treatment, about half of them don't. And so most of us do the treat and extend thing and it works pretty well. 
And yeah, that was excellent. One of the other thing is when you see hemorrhages in the retina, look hard for a distribution around a vein. And if you can find one, it saves you a lot of hassle because it's just a vein. Vein occlusions are so common. So they can, you can see them nasally, you see them all over the place. But, and if you don't see hemorrhages around a vein, then you got 